All right, uh, thank, thank you all for coming out. Um, the talk today is called Mapping Literature. Um, and uh, as I mentioned on the flyer, this is for the sixth International Sunday Days on Literary Space, which is happening in um, September um, in, uh, in Portugal. And so I do want to thank um, uh, my host at that event, even though I'm not able to come. Uh, so I'd like to start by thanking Professor um, Ana Maria Costa Lopez uh, and other members of the organizing committee uh, for inviting me, the sponsors, including the Topas group, and everyone else involved in putting together um, the, these events. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, and I hope that I can visit some other time. Uh, I also want to thank Matt Greengold here at Texas State and everyone here for uh, coming out to hear the talk. Thanks. Um, this will be about 45 minutes, so just to give you a sense of how much you're going to have to endure. Uh, I'd like to speak about literary criticism after what has been called the spatial turn. And along those lines, I want to focus on geocriticism, a relatively novel approach to literary and cultural studies that establishes space, place, and mapping, and more generally, spatial relations at the heart of the critical enterprise. I'll discuss the spatial turn itself briefly, but an underlying, uh, underlying idea is that our own time is somehow distinctively characterized by spatiality, more so than earlier epochs, uh, which is I admit, a somewhat dubious um, proposal. But um, that uh, if so, then therefore critics must pay greater attention to matters of space than they have done previously. A certain place-mindedness, which I refer to now as topophrenia, takes on a more urgent role in literary and cultural studies in the present. In a word, then, space is timely. And uh, for a moment of a shameless plug, my new book is called Topophrenia, Place, Narrative, and the Spatial Imagination, and it comes out in January. Thus. The geocritical moment is upon us, and yet, honestly, I wonder if I'm the best person to advocate for the special timeliness of geocriticism, given my somewhat expansive understanding of the theory and practice. For example, even though I've followed my old professor, Frederick Jamison, uh, as well as Michel Foucault, David Harvey, Edward Soja, and others in affirming that our era is, in many ways, characterized by an enhanced sense of spatiality and spatial relations, I've also spent a lot of time and energy arguing <clears throat> for an idea of literary cartography, which, while certainly not ahistorical or even transhistorical, nevertheless is connected to various ways of making sense of the world that I associate with narrative, and therefore is as old as storytelling itself. Uh, as such, my idea about uh, my ideas about these things draw heavily from theorists like Jameson, yes, but also Northrop Frye. Georg Lukács, Eric Auerbach, and eventually, I suppose, back to Aristotle. An article I wrote on literary spatiality a couple of years ago, for example, I focused on um, uh, examples from The Odyssey, The Inferno, Don Quixote, Moby Dick, which are hardly postmodern texts, and I don't want you to think they are postmodern texts, even though you'll occasionally get people um, suggesting that postmodernism can move across the ages, which was the title of a 1993 collection of essays. Actually, a very good collection. Um, uh, I do think that uh, you know, the uh, a aspects of this spatiality can be seen in, in text, but that doesn't make them postmodern. Um, a geocritical approach, one that is informed by and reflects upon recent uh, spatial and geographical theories, can be used to good effects in producing novel interpretations and analyses of older texts as well as new ones, but that's not entirely my point either. I, I also want to distinguish as best I can between the attention to space, place, and mapping that might be associated with geocriticism and the more traditional and yet still spatially oriented aspects of literary studies that I think are familiar to, uh, to all. Indeed, attention to space and place is nothing new in literature. Uh, distinctive settings, 
region, landscape, other pertinent geographical features are often crucial to the meaning and effectiveness of literary works. Whole genres may be defined by such spatial or geographical characteristics, such as the pastoral poem, the travel narrative, Utopia, or the urban expose. Innumerable other examples across literary history, criticism, and theory could be cited. I could argue that while space or place is crucial to discussions of setting, regionalism, certain genres, and so on, many of the critical approaches to them acknowledged uh, such spatial features only then to ignore them or to relegate them to a more or less passive presence in the background. For instance, the distinctively southern locale of William Faulkner's or Flannery O'Connor's stories is unavoidable, but the critical focus of many readings quickly moves on to other matters of character, morality, sexuality, race, on the one hand, or formal considerations like point of view, stream of consciousness, foreshadowing, and so forth on the other. As authors of a recent study of geography and narratology state, quote, space is a relatively neglected dimension of narrative. That's, I'm sorry, Marie Lore, Ryan, Kenneth Foote, and Moez uh, Azar Yahoo's uh, uh, relatively recent book, Narrating Space, Spatializing Narrative. Uh, but the purported domination of time over space in criticism may, may uh, be, you know, a discussion for another time, and it do uh, has its uh, uh, de debate debates within it. Um, one one final caveat: I know I'm, I'm introducing all the things I'm not going to talk about, <laughs> which is a weird way to talk. So so it goes. Um, uh, I use the term geocriticism in a, in a different, uh, somewhat broader way than Bertrand Westfall does, at least uh, as he does in his book called Geocriticism. There he advocates for a geocentric approach to literature, contrasting it with the egocentric approaches that focus on an individual writer, for example. Westfall's geocritic um, would start with the place, say, a region or a city, and then assemble a corpus of text so as to provide a multifocal, polysensory representation of the place. Um, he and his team have done this, for example, with the Dalmatian Islands to, to um, do a literary uh, analysis, geocritical analysis of that place. Um, so a corpus might include not only fiction and poetry, but film, travel log, tourist brochures, architectural studies, urban planning documents even, and, and, and so on. A key advantage to the method is that by drawing together many different texts in an interdis interdisciplinary array, one might avoid or minimize personal bias, prejudice, or stereotypes. An obvious problem, one readily acknowledged by Westfall himself, lies in determining what constitutes a valid corpus. How many texts and of what kind do we gather before we can begin to read the place? Westfall speaks of a threshold of representativeness, but it's clear that not all would agree on when and where that threshold has been reached. I think the project is fascinating, but I also have no problem looking at, for example, Virginia Woolf's London, or Faulkner's Yachna Batafa County, or C.S. Lewis's Narnia, just to mention three different fictional places. Um, and that's just to, to close out that, that footnote. Westfall is a little concerned that if you're only focusing, say, on Joyce's Dublin, you only get Joyce's perception of Dublin and not a picture of Dublin. Um, and so he's not opposed to, to looking at one author. It's just that this geocritical method would want to uh, have a much broader array of, of literary sources. Okay. All right, I want to suggest that geocriticism be understood in connection to what I'm calling topophrenia and literary cartography. And together, these form a somewhat complex, discontinuous, and recursive set of creative and critical activities, informing each other while maintaining a degree of semi-autonomy. Speaking too loosely, I could place each term in its own distinctive category, but they would perforce bleed into one another in practice. Schematically, the first, topophrenia, is existential. The second, literary cartography, poetic. And the third, geocriticism, analytical, interpretive, or evaluative, which is to say, critical. 
or put more simply, if not more clearly, they refer to perceiving, writing, and reading, but of course they are all inextricably bound up in the far messier notion of being. And I hope you will forgive the neologism, but I've used this term topophrenia, partly in response to topophilia, a key idea from Gustin Bachelard's The Poetics of Space, and the word used by cultural geographer Yifu Tuong as the title of his influential 1974 book. I find the concept of topophilia to be very useful, but Tuong's sunny disposition occasionally leads him to overlook the less pleasant aspects of our experience with space and place. Topophilia obviously means love of place, and I find that often our relationship to given places is not one that is uh, loving. Um, in fairness to Tuan, he also wrote a book called Landscapes of Fear, uh, so he's well aware of what might be called topophobia, which is actually the title of a very good book, uh, a recent phenomenological study by Dylan Trigg on um, spaces that we, we, we may fear. Um, regardless of the terminology used, it seems to me that a crucial consideration of any properly spatial literary studies is the pervasive sense not only of place, but of place-mindedness, where characters, I'm sorry, which characterizes both the subjective experience and the artistic representation of places, persons, events, and, and, and so forth. I agree with Jameson's understanding of narrative as, quote, the central function or instance of the human mind, but I would supplement it with the proposition that any such narrative function be understood as itself a form of mapping, which is what I have in mind with the idea of literary cartography. The dynamic spatio-temporal relations among subject, situation, representation, and interpretation invite critical approaches to literature that are sensitive to the uncertain, often shiftings, uh, but, often, uh, but always pertinent ways that place haunts the mind. Hence, I propose topophrenia as a provisional label for that condition of narrative, one that is necessary to any reading or writing of a text, in which the persistence of place and of the subject's relation to it must be taken into account. Such place-mindedness is not to be understood as a simplistic relation between a given writer and his or her distinctive place, Henry David Thoreau at Walden Pond, for example. Although any careful analysis of such a relationship would almost certainly disclose that things are not really that simple after all. As, for example, when the topographic lines of, say, Thoreau's Walden narrative extend or reach dead ends, intersect with others, proliferate, combine, establish new lines entirely. Rather, topophrenia suggests the degree to which all thinking is, in various ways, thinking about place, which also means that the relations among places, as well as the subjects uh, and places, uh, those among the subjects and the places in the broadest possible sense. In practice, this represents not so much a geographical unconscious as it does an existential comportment toward the world. This comportment creates problems as well as opportunities for spatial literary criticism. Topophrenia characterizes the subject, uh, subjective engagement with a given place, with one sense of place, and with the possible projection of alternative spaces. Moreover, it requires us to consider the apparently objective structures and systems which condition our perceptions and experience, experiences of space and place. So, Place-mindedness here must be understood to coincide with an entire range of affects, attitudes, conceptions, perceptions, references, and sensibilities that characterize the spatial imagination. In contrast to Tuan's mostly sweet and light topophilia, this sensibility or affect is not always pleasant, homely, or secure, but rather takes place in a wildly oscillatory but often systematic array of forces that determine the relationship between the subject and the social or even, we might say, cosmic totality. Yet any, uh, yet any topo uh, I'm sorry, topophrenic condition or attitude is also necessarily open to the delights of space and place, to the play of spatial practices in which we invariably find ourselves both inscribed and inscribing. <clears throat> 
The experience of a place is no simple matter. Any proper orientation or sense of place is connected to and complicated by a seemingly infinite network of spaces and places that not only serve as shifting points of view or frames of reference, but can also affect the situation subject itself. A place is apprehended subjectively, but it is also understandable as such only when located within or in reference to a non-subjective or super-subjective ensemble of spatial relations, sites, networks, circuits, and so on. In fact, and this brings me to the matter of literary cartography, the apprehension of place is bound up in a discursive or narrative ensemble of relations that determine the outcome by implicating the subjective perception and the objective or non-subjective thing in itself within a tenuous, unstable, and ever-changing system that of language itself, for example. That was a long sentence. Um, if, as Tuan insists, place is defined in part by, uh, as a site or a, uh, uh, a discrete identifiable segment of space, a portion of space that is imbued with meaning, therefore that is subject to interpretation and thus an appropriate topic for literary criticism, it also needs to be understood that language, the language used to describe and interpret the place, itself engenders or conditions the place. The place is a text, but uh, one that is not necessarily, uh, I'm sorry, one that is necessarily informed and perhaps formed by other texts as well. By literary cartography, I refer to the way that a writer figuratively maps the territories represented in the work in such a way as to provide the reader with a more or less useful sense of the world um, and the subject's relations to it. The map is at once a rather simple tool and a very powerful conceptual figure. Everyone already knows what a map is and what it's used for, and yet the map is also a much contested object or metaphor in critical theory and beyond. Uh, for instance, mapping has been associated with empire, social repression, all manner of ideological programs geared towards manipulating the representations of space for this or that group's political benefit. Mapping has also been uh, viewed as, a crucial, uh, as crucial to any sort of liberatory political project, as the need for spatial and social representation makes itself all too apparent amid the potential disorientation and alienation of unmapped territories. At a more basic existentialist level, Mapping is an inevitable, not to say neutral, activity, for the individual subject cannot help but try to orient itself by imagining its position vis-a-vis -vis that of other subjects and in relation to a broader objective reality. Indeed, notwithstanding the multiple ambiguities attendant to any cartographic enterprise, one might suggest that mapping is almost essential to our being. I map, therefore I am. The injunction amount makes itself felt most urgently, perhaps, in situations in which one is lost, desperately seeking guideposts or markers that can identify one's place in relation to other places. I, of course, joked about this with some of you, but um, the, my own interest in space and mapping may be related to the fact that I get lost a lot. <laughs> that may be part of the problem. Um, to call for a map or to demand that someone engage in mapping is to recognize one's own disorientation, one's displacement in space, or one's loss of a sense of place, which is undoubtedly alienating, if not also terrifying. There's spatial anxiety associated with being lost, somewhat like the angst that accompanies the existential condition a la Heidegger and Sartre, brings with it a visceral awareness of, of place and space, which might otherwise be taken for granted or left safely tucked away in the unconscious. The sudden need to map, or at least to have access to a map, propels to the fore that topophrenia that remains with us at all times, um, a constant and uneasy place-mindedness which characterizes the subject's interactions with his or her environment, which is itself so broadly conceived as to include the lived space of any given personal experience, say the stroll about the shopping mall, as well as the abstract space whose true representation is beyond any one individual's kin, uh, larger 
national, international, or ultimately universal space of a world system. But although it may be experienced most keenly in those moments of disorientation, the fact is that a persistent place-mindedness as well as a need to map are constant features of our existence, I believe. Topophrenia characterizes nearly all human activity as a sense of place, not to mention matters of displacement and replacement, of movement between places and over spaces, and of the multifarious relations among place, space, individuals, collectivities, events, and so on. Um, the sense of place is an essential element of thought, experience, and being. Along those lines, it's worth noting that uh, merely to think of a place is already to be mapping. This cartographic imperative lies at the heart of the spatial imagination. We're always mapping whether we're aware of it or not. Perhaps it goes without saying, Foucault liked to say it goes better with saying, that um, the map is a metaphor, uh, but it is no less powerful for being figurative. Indeed, I would say that it is only just metaphorical, since the spatial imagination, which is both the motive and the basis for the project of literary cartography, is necessarily connected to the real spaces, say geography, architecture, for instance, as well as to the imagined spaces that constitute the world, whether conceived of as a social sphere or continent, a planet or the universe. A holistic view of spatiality informs my sense of topophrenia, as well as the projects of literary cartography and narrative and geocriticism in, in reading, since the spaces and places involved must be considered in their persistently real imagined and real and imagined states, to cite Soja's famous expression. Some of you may be familiar with Edward Soja's book, Third Space, in which he combines the words real and imagined into one term. If mapping be partly metaphorical, therefore, it still uh, has a literal force in the fact that spatiality is a fundamental aspect of our own being. Moreover, although it cannot be denied that a certain cartographic imperative or mapping project lies at the heart of human experience, and aesthetic representation across different historical moments, it does seem to me that the different historical and social formations have produced distinctively spatial organizations, as Henri Lefebvre has maintained in the production of space, in, in which case certain times and places have likely called for a greater attention to or awareness of problems of spatial representation or orientation than others. Consequently, Levels of cartographic activity may uh, vary depending on one's historical, social, and spatial situation, and the need to produce figural maps may be more or less urgent. As noted earlier, many prominent critics have pointed out that ours is, and has been for some time now, an epoch of enhanced spatiality. The so-called spatial turn in the humanities and social sciences in recent years is partly the result of this heightened sense of the importance of space, place, and mapping to those fields in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Jameson's idea of cognitive mapping uh, was developed in part to deal with this aspect of the present, as he called it, postmodern condition. Um, it's getting farther and farther away from 1984, so I'm not sure how long we can keep calling this uh, the present, but uh, uh, my colleague Philip uh, Wegner has referred to uh, our more recent period as perhaps late postmodernism. So we'll see how, how long that postmodern condition can obtain. Um, Jameson had, uh, has conceded that cognitive mapping was really a code word for class consciousness, but it was nevertheless to be understood as a form of consciousness especially suited to quote that new spatiality implicit in the postmodern. Jameson goes on to explain that the figure of the map, uh, quote, retains the advantage of involving concrete content, imperialism, the world system, subalternity, uh, dependency, and hegemony, while necessarily involving a program of formal analysis of a new kind, since it is centrally defined by the dilemma of representation itself, end quote. Whether the map can be considered a literal form or a figure of a sort of narrative representation, I have in mind in my use of the term 
literary cartography. The flexibility and effectiveness of mapping make it uh, an exemplary model for literary and cultural studies, if not for the humanities and social sciences to core. Inasmuch as humans are political animals, in Aristotle's famous definition, we're also storytelling animals. And all narratives may be taken as a form of literary cartography, for in telling stories we orient ourselves and others with respect to space and place, not to mention, of course, moments of time. And we produce dynamic, multiform, protean cartographies. A geocritical approach to reading these narrative maps enables us to sense more emphatically the ways that space, place, and mapping condition our lives, attitudes, thoughts, and experiences, as well as our more critically distant claims to knowledge about them. As Frank Kermode once said, it is not for critics to help us make sense of our lives, that's the burden of the poets and other creative writers, but merely, quote, to attempt the lesser feat of making sense of the ways we try to make sense of our lives. In our time, after the spatial turn, geocritics, spatially oriented critics, and others working in the spatial humanities can offer interpretations, analyses, and evaluations of these ways of making sense or giving form to our lives by paying particular attention to the spatial imagination, its motivation, and its results. We may come to see the world and ourselves in interesting new ways. And this is where I see geocriticism broadly conceived as being particularly effective in our own time, a moment in which the spatio-temporal relations and the crises of representation, uh, once associated with modernity or even post-modernity, have become ever more complicated. I don't wish to indulge in the romantic visions of the past, but I do hold to Lefebvre's idea that, uh, of the historical production of social spaces, as well as to the spatial histories of, say, uh, Fernand Brodel or later Emmanuel Wallerstein in attempting to limb the contours of an emergent world system. And again, along with Foucault, Jameson, Westfall, and others who have drawn connections between the existential experience of the individual subject with the structural conditions uh, beyond one's immediate experience uh, that nevertheless affected. For a variety of reasons having to do with geopolitics, transnational commerce, other economic matters, financialization, telecommunications, transformation, uh, transportation, high technology, and other things. A certain cartographic anxiety, as the geographer Derek Gregory has called it, and a heightened sense of place does seem typical uh, of the present epoch of late capitalism, postmodernism, the age of globalization, to name a few popular labels intended to name the present system. It becomes more difficult to make sense of or to give form to the world as it exists as we experience it. I'm sorry, as it exists and as we experience it. Two registers that do not find themselves neatly aligned. As, quote, sorry, quote, the truth of one's experience no longer coincides with the place where it takes place, to cite Jameson once again. In view of this uh, profoundly critical uh, and even the enhanced sense of the spatial and geographic registers, it's only right to call it geocritical uh, approach to our experience and our world seems fitting. So I have three sort of related reasons for saying this and for focusing on the geocritical um, and uh, I guess I should say geocritical as a kind of literary <coughs> criticism. First, uh, drawing on Tuan's definition of place with respect to space, the former lies squarely within the disciplinary bailiwick of literary studies, since place is understood by Tuan to be endowed with meaning and subject to interpretation, and literary criti criticism, among other practices, takes interpretation along with analysis and evaluation to be central to its mission, or at least it traditionally has. Geocriticism, with its heightened attention to matters of place, space, and mapping, is all the more suited to that task. Second, as Jameson has pointed out, criticism in its focus on language and its attention to the need to interpret allows us to deal more effectively with the complexities of our current condition. This is a, a slightly longer quote from 
Jameson's uh, The Political Unconscious. No society has ever been quite so mystified in so many ways as our own. Saturated as it is with messages and information, the very vehicles of mystification. But above and beyond the sheer fact of mystification, we must point to the supplementary problem involved in the study of cultural or literary texts, in other words, essentially of narratives. For even if uh, discursive language were taken literally, were to be taken literally, there is always and constitutively a problem about the meaning of narratives as such. End quote. The narrative maps produced through literary cartography are equally subject to hermeneutic investigation, even as they uh, also serve as a means by which to interpret the underlying spaces they endeavor to represent. And third, I cite Northrop Fry's impassioned defense of the presentation of uh, defense and presentation of literary criticism as a means of educating the imagination, which is the title of his book uh, from 1964 based on public lectures he had given on the CBC radio. Um, if the study of literature produces an educated imagination, then spatially oriented study of literature attuned to literary cartography and geocritical inquiry can only strengthen the spatial imagination, a faculty all too necessary for making sense of our place, our world, and therefore also ourselves. So it makes sense that literature or literary studies occupies a privileged position in both spatial, spatiality studies and in our lives. If I've not really discussed a clear methodology for a topophrenic or geocritical reading practice, it's partly because I believe that in practice, the most effective forms of geocriticism would necessarily embrace a number of different perspectives, methods, theories, and approaches, which in turn might depend on strategic choices and local conditions. Claude Lévi-Strauss's bricolure remains an apt figure for the geocritic, particularly if we understand, as did Derrida, that the engineer must engage in bricolage no less than any other. Uh, along those lines, I continue to marvel at the innovative and exciting ways that critics in recent years have analyzed wide varieties of cultural texts, and I wouldn't want to prescribe any particular way of reading even if I could. I suppose that in my own case, I remain very much a Marxist critic of the Jamesonian sensibility, insofar as I think the various means by which different critics arrive at this or that conclusion may offer further insight into our attempts to make sense of the big picture that can only emerge through the painstaking processes of connecting the disparate strands into a cognizable whole. Similarly, the sort of topocritic, uh, topophrenic or geocritical approach I have in mind would underscore the significance of spatiality, of space and place, but not to the exclusion of other factors that make up the objective conditions and the subjective perceptions that combine shape the world we live in. We are always situated, always in the midest, and therefore always mapping. But the maps we produce, as well as uh, analyze and evaluate, are themselves provisional, tentative, subject to constant modification. In giving form to the spaces and places of both our experience and our imagination, we help establish the contours of our own world and to speculate upon potential alternatives, uh, which necessarily combines the realistic and the utopian dimensions of the cartographic imagination. All of that said, I'm also loath to end on too triumphal or hyperbolic a note as I think we've all by now become weary of literary critics making outrageous claims for the moral or social benefits of this or that methodology. Never believe the smooth safe space will save us, warned Deleuze and Guattari. Um, if a geocritical approach to works of literature and culture were to offer nothing other than some new, different, and interesting interpretation of this or that text, or maybe provide an analytical framework for future studies, then that would by itself be worthwhile, without a doubt. If geocriticism can do more, so much the better. Given what I take to be our fundamentally topographic condition with a sort of cartographic imperative underwriting the concomitant production of literary maps and the urgency with which we are confronted with the spatio-temporal perplexities in our own present condition, I think the geocritical approach is well suited to our present moment and I look forward to seeing 
what sort of insights and alternative visions may be <laughs> disclosed by geocritical readings to come. Above all, I'm looking forward to seeing what the new maps will show us, not only about the spaces rendered upon their figured surfaces, but about the map makers as well. Thank you.